Good morning, Interweb. Worldbuilders Log 41. We are, as always, continuing to worldbuild our fictional planet here, placeholder name Kretak. Last time around, we finished off our climate zones. This time around, we are going to look at rivers. We're going to take a map that looks like this and turn it into something that looks like this. That's a little bit hard to see. Hold on. There we go. But before we embark on our River Ryan adventures, uh, we got to do some follow up. So Nikolai of Worldbuilding Pasta Fame, the best worldbuilding blog on the internet, bar none. You got to go check it out. Links in all the usual places. Nikolai went ahead and he simulated the climate of Kretak using Exoplan Sim, that software he uses to simulate climate. I thought I'd just flash it on screen for a bit, talk about it, compare and contrast, that kind of thing. Caveats here, Exoplasm does some weird things. For example, in the tropics, particularly in the tropics, coastal and island regions tend to be modeled too dry. West coasts tend to be a little bit too cold. East coasts tend to be a little bit too warm. And overall, the average temperature of the planet in the simulation is 16 degrees Celsius. That's like two degrees Celsius off where it should be, but it's close enough that it's within a decent margin of error, so we can still kind of make comparisons. So we just need to keep those caveats in mind as we compare. And look, I don't think we did too bad. Like there are obviously going to be difference between what a human can do and what a computer can do, but I think we're pretty much in the ballpark, which is kind of cool. The big standout things to me are the fact that the computer does not want to give Degra desert. I find that very interesting. It also seems to not want to give much credit to the Gulf Stream effect here. Like if you notice, I ran a bunch of sea climates way up the coast here. The rationale for that is that I said that there was a strong-ish sort of Gulf Stream effect. Computer says no. Again, caveat, West Coast tend to be a bit too cool. But like the computer wants to run Tundra all the way down. Again, really interesting. Now, I'm not going to go changing my map based on this because again, we're just working on different axioms, me and the computer. But the one, one little tweak I do want to make, and this is more based on feedback and comments I got in the previous videos, is this little highland region here in Degra. Lots of people are pointing out that this is probably too dry. Like it's smack bang on the equator. Steps right on the equator, probably not a good idea. And the computer seems to agree with this. It has no step regions in this sort of highland bit here. And I also did a bit of comparing and contrasting with similar elevations on Earth at similar latitudes. And yeah, no steps. So I'm just going to take a beat and just erase those steps, make uh, turn them into savannah, and then we'll crack on to rivers. Delightful. So, for rivers, I'm going to be following Rivers and Wetlands by the wonderful Madeline James. Links in all the usual places. Highly recommend this guide. Super easy to follow. Just great. Please go check out Madeline's stuff. So to start with, we are going to take a continent. I'm going to take Esri in this video, and I'm going to divide it up into drainage basins by marking in my drainage divides. So a drainage basin is essentially an area where all the water flows into the basin and out through a single point. And drainage divides basically demarcate drainage basins. On one side of the divide, water flows into one basin. On the other side of the divide, water flows into a different basin. The water flows in opposite directions. So to figure out where your drainage divides are, you simply need to just trace along your highest elevation regions, your ridges, your hills, your mountain ranges, until you either create a closed shape or meet the sea. So for example here, if we take this mountain range here, if I'm working on this little local section, I am pretty confident that the highest points will run along this sort of ridge line here. And I can see the highest kind of local points, the highest contiguous points following along here through this high portion here, through this little mountain range, and then maybe out through the sea, through this headland. Something like that. Water on this side will flow into this basin. Water on this side will flow into this basin. So if we do the same thing again on the other side, let's say the highest points are along this central ridge line, run it down through here, connect it up to the next mountain range, all the way down and out, say, to the ocean through this headland. Another drainage divide, water flows this direction on this side and then the opposite direction on the other side. And hey presto, we've created a drainage basin. All the water will flow in here, but will flow out to this stretch of ocean here. This sort of drainage basin that empties into an ocean is called an exoreic basin. Exo meaning external water flows out, like 80% of the time our drainage basins will be exoreic. 
but not always. If we pop up to the central plateau in Esri here, and if I do the same thing, just follow along all the contiguous highest portions along my mountain ridges, my hills, etc. Creating our drainage divides, we'll find that a very different structure emerges. Something like that. We get a basin that does not flow into the sea. This is called an endorheic basin. Endo, internal, doesn't flow out to the sea. We'll talk about what happens with endorheic basins a little bit, but for now, I'm just going to go through and carve up Esri in this manner. Every time I find an endorheic basin, I'm just going to mark it as an X to remind myself as to what's going on. Time lapse engaged. Oh, and sorry, I'm going to go for kind of major basins, but knowing me, I might get a little bit into the weeds and start carving up smaller basins. We'll just see. The level of detail is entirely up to you. All right, drainage basins done. This step is a good opportunity to redo a bit of topography if you feel like it. I would like to just take a beat and deal with this pass here. I think I'm gonna close this up. Two reasons. It kind of makes this basin more um, basin-y. There's no gap in the basin. Also, and kind of, I think more importantly, I'm kind of in love with the idea of giving like a single access point into the depths of Eastern Esri. It's kind of like the Isthmus of Panama, like a single choke point. That's kind of cool. So I'll take a beat and I'm going to fill this boyo in. So my first job here is for every basin, specifically for every exo reek basin, so the ones not marked with an X, we'll leave them to later. I want to come in and I want to mark in that basin's primary first order river, like the main river of the basin. So say for example in this basin here, I would go about locating my primary first order river by cross-referencing my topography, precipitation and climate zone maps. So for topography, I want to be looking for areas of high elevation for this river to start in. So we're looking at this mountain range here and up here. Then I want to draw on my precipitation maps and I want to find the wettest area year round. So in summer, it looks like it's very wet along this mountain range, a little bit less wet up here. In winter, the rains kind of peter off to the lowlands. So it looks like somewhere in this mountain range is probably where my primary river will begin, where its headwaters will be. And finally, we should check in with the climate zone map and just make a note of the fact that we're running through continental and temperate climates. So with all that in mind, I'm going to draw a river out of this mountain and into this outlet here. Key things to remember here, water, it flows downhill always, never uphill. Rivers, they never split. And the river will always take the path of least resistance. Now we are world builders, so we can always modify the topography if we need to, but for the most part, I want to try and just follow my topography, bearing in mind those three rules and get my river to the sea. So I'm going to say I start off here and I'm just going to try and find my valleys and go through them. Super simple, rinse and repeat for each Exoreic Basin. You also want to like kind of bias things towards long rivers. So in this basin, for example, we see we have year round precipitation along this kind of mountain where we only have kind of strong precipitation in winter up in these mountains. I decided to just declare that there's more precipitation happening up here as a year round average just to get a longer river. So there's lots of flexibility and artistic license you can pull during like this river step. Sorry, it's me again, more stuff to explain. I have a really bad habit of just like cutting off the precipitation at the thousand meter mark. I really need to not do that next time around. So it looks like this entire basin is basically just all dry up in the highlands. 
in actuality, this precipitation would totally just keep going up to the ridge and we can get some spillover, etc. So they chose to start the primary river up in these highlands here. That's me compensating for just being way too conservative with precipitation back many, many moons ago. Right, me again again, sorry. This basin here, mainly arid. Remember, all regions get some degree of precipitation. River originates in the steppe here, so what I'm going to do is, or what I did, was just make a thinner stroke for this river, showing that the flow isn't as strong. In this region here, this basin basically gets no precipitation. It's like all desert. Therefore, I've chosen to uh, put it in as a dashed line. Either that river is extremely intermittent, only it, it only flows on the rare occasions that some precipitation gets into this basin, or it's an ancient dried up river. I'm not gonna make that distinction now. I'm just gonna jot it in. I can edit it later. Again, don't be afraid to make the topography respect you if it produces a more aesthetic shape. In these really long coastal basins, like along Andean mountain ranges, don't be afraid to put in a couple of first order rivers. One does not suffice for something so long and slender. So, a couple of things here in the East Esri Basin. Number one, this basin here gets no precipitation, at least not in the high elevation regions, and it's like all desert up near where I would put the headwaters. In order to get more moisture into this basin here, I'm declaring that there's gaps in this Andean-like mountain range, which is reflected in topography, that's allowing water to come through and enter this basin. So essentially the headwaters of this river here are temperate. And on this side of the mountain range, we have precipitation year round. So that's plenty strong enough to keep this stream flowing through the desert all year round. The other thing is again, in this bigger basin, no precipitation in the high elevation regions. So I'm relying on meltwater. We get super duper cold in the winter, lots of snow. And in the summer, we're between about zero and six degrees, I think, negative six. Zero, positive six, yes, between zero and six degrees. So that's plenty enough to melt the snow, hence to feed this river. Oh, and in polar regions or in polar climes, I reduced the stroke again of the river to kind of hint at a decreased flow. Okay, primary rivers, exoreic basins, done. Before we move on to the endoreic basins, the basins that don't empty out into a sea, two things to point out. One, this river here is bananas. It's like a hyper Nile. It might be the longest river I have literally ever drawn in. I've marked it in as permanent, not as ephemeral or intermittent, because I think I can make it permanent, but that's for later in the video. The other thing is hopefully it should become clear that because we have seasonal precipitation maps, we can track the flow of the river by season. So for example, this river up here, it gets its precipitation in summer, therefore it flows strongest in summer. Perhaps there is summer flooding going on and no flooding in the winter, weaker flow. Whereas if we compare it with the rivers along this coastline here, 
they get year-round precipitation, so the river would flow at like a constant rate. This obviously has like deep and lasting ramifications for any cultures that like choose to settle these rivers. So just fun stuff. Anyhow, endorheic basins, let's go. So basic shtick here is that we want to have like tops no more than about 20% of our basins be endorheic basins. So I'd be looking at trying to get rid of some of these endorheic basins, basically turn them into exorheic basins. I think a prime candidate here is probably this upper plateau section. For no other reason than whatever precipitation or snow melt gathers in here, I'd like to punch a hole through maybe this lip here and bring all of that moisture into this basin. So just maximizing the amount of moisture here. So all the runoff here would primarily come down through this channel and feed into this basin, kind of creating like a hyper basin here. So we'll talk about this chap in a second. He could get quite interesting. These three here, these three basins, I think I'll keep them endorheic, which means the water is going to pool in the basin, forming one or more endorheic lakes. So these are like salinated lakes, like the Caspian Sea, where a bunch of water flows in, but no water flows out. It only escapes through evaporation. Now in these two here, we're quite far north, so the evaporation is going to be lessened like we're in polar climes, but the topography is so steep here that I think there's plenty of room to pool a bunch of little lakes everywhere. I think probably the same thing here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and jot in a couple of lakes. Cool, something like that. And finally, the big boy. So there's like a bajillion things we can do with this. Like idea number one, we could say that this is not in fact endorheic, it is exorheic, draining into this basin here and eventually into the sea because we're so far poleward, minimal evaporation, and we have like buckets of moisture. So tons of water is entering the system, not evaporating away very quickly. So we could expect this inland sea to like overflow and join up with this basin here. That would be kind of like scenario number one. Now, another idea could be, yeah, this lake here is filling up really rapidly given all the moisture in the area and the snow melt. But as it fills up, its surface area increases. Therefore, evaporation will increase because of the greater surface area. So we could see it kind of hit a sort of equilibrium and therefore say, you know, with some degree of confidence that this whole basin here is endorheic. It is like a giant Caspian Sea. In fact, remember, this is two times the size of the Caspian Sea. So that's the second idea. The third idea, and this is probably the coolest idea, is that we just have an oscillation, right? So we're not in the equilibrium state. This lake does overflow periodically, but we just so happen to be presenting the world at a time period where it's not overflowing. It's just perhaps full to the brim. This I think is the most interesting because we get to keep a rather large endorheic basin. And also we could probably mark in a bunch of like canyon formations, possibly along here, to indicate that like structures were formed the last time this overflowed. And the topography also kind of hints at that. We have this very fragmented topography. So I think that's what I might end up doing. The fourth idea, just it's not really a very useful idea, but I'm just going to throw it out there. You could have, you could technically make it a cryptorheic basin in that kind of like karst landscape. This does actually empty into the sea, but it's just not obvious. Like the river starts here. There's some sort of underwater exit point and it emerges out here. Now, I know everyone's going to be like, oh my god, that's class. I am not confident doing it at a world map sort of scale, nor am I confident doing it uh, when I don't know what the what's going on with the rocks in the area. So that's just a fun idea, not really pick up. But I do like the oscillating lake, and we're in a period of non-flooding. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to make a little canyon formation here, time-lapse mode engaged. All 
All right, something like that. Now, I tried to keep the canyon such that you couldn't really see it on the world map, kind of like the Grand Canyon in real life. And I kept it about the length of the Grand Canyon, like the main portion here is a couple hundred kilometers long. That's pretty neat. Just, I think, one more primary river to go, and then we're on to the next stage. Oh, and I also tried to keep it the depth of the Grand Canyon. Essentially, I used the Grand Canyon as a model here. Okay, those are all of our first order primary rivers. Next, what we're going to do is add in our second order and third order rivers in each basin. So your second order rivers are your tributaries to your main river, and your third order rivers are tributaries to your tributaries. And feel free, of course, to add in extra rivers about the place, just like flesh it out. General rule of thumb, in your tropical and your temperate areas, you want to have a greater density of rivers than in your continental regions, which in turn should have a greater density of rivers than your polar regions. Essentially what you're looking for is kind of like a taper from the equator to the pole with the rivers becoming less and less. There's nothing to this, it's the exact same process as plotting in your primary rivers. So sit back, relax, enjoy. Just remember the key rules. Rivers flow downhill, they'll take the easiest path, and just never split your rivers. Rivers join, never split. And if you want, edit the topography to make cool things happen. Okay, Rivers Esri done. Turns out we can in fact keep our giganto desert river here by punching a hole in the Andean mountain range or many holes in the Andean mountain range and take some of this moisture from this sopping wet coastline and feed it into the center of the desert. Very cool. Quick note on the intermittent rivers. I'm connecting all of them up to the stem river. Chances are though, the water would never actually flow all the way to the stem river. This is just a representation of the maximal path. They'd peter out before the stem river in most, if not all cases. Right, last, last thing I want to do is I want to talk glacial lakes, but it's five o'clock here. It's dinner time for me, so I'm going to come back to you tomorrow. Hello, I'm back. It is next day Edgar here. The dinner was very nice. Thank you for asking. What were we doing? Oh yeah, we were going to put in some glacial lakes. So, Cretac here, it's got some ice coverage, right? It's got some glaciers going on. I would hardly call this an ice age though, so I reckon at some time in the past, this ice would have uh, existed way far poleward. Glacial lakes form as a consequence of this ice. Basically, all the ice cuts depressions into the land, then as the glaciers uh, retreat, these depressions are exposed, they're filled with meltwater. Hey presto, glacial lakes, delightful. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just roughly sketch in where we think um, the extent of the ice was during the last glacial maximum and take it from there. So I'm feeling something a little bit like this. All right, cool. That line here represents the maximal extent of the ice. It's a sort of terminator line. Now, how I got to this was largely just like, just guesswork based on vibes. 
but there's a there's a little bit of thought put behind it. Uh, first thing is that the higher the elevation, the colder it is, the more equatorward I push the line. Also, the more I went to east coasts, the more equatorward I push the line. You'll notice that it's closer to the equator here than it is here. Recall that there is a hypercontinental zone going on here. That's the reason behind that. And the other thing is I made sure to not go below 40 degrees. In fact, I stayed well away from the 40 degree line, latitude line, uh, because if you go too far equatorward, the planet is so cold that you kind of trigger like a runaway snowball earth effect, which is what we don't want. So we're going to find some glacial lakes within this zone. According to Madeline, we're looking for areas that are wet or wetter. Now we're using a slightly different precipitation model to Madeline, but I think they should be interoperable. So wet, we're also perhaps looking for between mountain ranges might be a good location or in or near the headwaters of a river we've already drawn. So we want to keep those three things in mind and we'll see can we find any interesting lakes. Time lapse mode engaged. Okay, I think that's good. I played a little bit hard and fast uh, with Madeline's rules here. Like these two lakes are in a drier region, but I really wanted to kind of show or like indicate like that at one stage there was a terminal line running along here. So I wanted like a line of lakes. Also, I included like modern meltwater lakes here at the boundary of our ice caps. Same jazz over here. We have like a line of these glacier lakes kind of hinting at the history of the world. I didn't do any more because I figure actually, again, if we think in terms of terminal line, if we have a terminal line running along here, you know, it will be going through this inland sea. So perhaps if this inland sea were to become completely drained, you'd see little lakes or rather large glacial lakes occurring in here. So I think that's pretty neat. And I also think that's us done. Actually, sorry, just to make it explicit, obviously there'd be a lot more lakes on this world. Like every single one of these kind of heavily flowing rivers would have like a bajillion lakes along their course. We're not showing them there. I'm only showing the kind of the most major lakes of the world. Implicitly, a lot more exist. Obviously, same thing with the rivers. Like implicitly, there's going to be a bunch more rivers than what's shown here. But there's only so much time I can dedicate to rivers. So anyhow, that's what we worked on in this video. Off camera, I did the rest of the world and it now looks like this. You see, we got some juicy glacial lakes here. We have like an endorheic ice margin lake here, which I think is pretty neat. Dare I say so, it looks pretty tasty. Here's it without the drainage divides. And with that, rivers done. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you'll join me next time for more world building. Big love to y'all. Big love to the patrons. Big love to Ross Bay Geo for their continued geographic advice and counsel. Absolutely love it. Until next time, it grows.